And uh, thanks for everybody. Meeting is now today. being recorded. The focus of today's webinar is about um, uh, really about maternal depression. Um, which, uh, for those familiar with the Implicit Network, understand that that's a, um, a major component of what our work is about. Um, in the past year, we've uh, really considered maternal depression in many venues outside of um, the typical ones uh, that we had previously thought about, uh, for instance, prenatal care um, or uh, in the setting of uh, maternal depression screening during well-child visits. Um, and we've uh, thought about maternal depression screening uh, and um, uh, intervention around maternal depression in the um, postpartum period or the fourth trimester as well. Um, really, um, when we think about it, uh, when you add all those times together, it's really about addressing um, um, uh, depression through um, the life cycle of reproductive health years. Um, and we wanted to think more comprehensively about what those screening recommendations were and how to uh, best address them. Um, so, Maha, are you changing the slides? Or? Yeah, Maha is yes. driving. Yeah. Got, got it, okay. Um, so a few goals for today's webinar. One is to, to think about um, clinical scenarios where we'll, we'll use depression screening. Um, and uh, what the, uh, our, our larger societies say about um, what the evidence is for screening at those times. Um, we'll look at some of the commonly used validated um, uh, instruments, including a PHQ-2, PHQ-9, and the Edinburgh. Um, we wanna think about why this is done or some of the barriers that impede implementation of uh, uh, depression screening at regular intervals um, in our practice sites or across our residencies that were at our institutions. Um, think about the prevalence rate uh, for, for women at different points in time in that reproductive life cycle, um, and then identify um, some of the missed opportunities and um, some of the drivers for persistent maternal depression, and we'll understand um, why that, um, uh, what, you know, why that's a significant um, finding um, as we talk through some of the most recent data. Uh, for today, uh, we're going to talk about the implicit uh, ICC model, which uh, looks like most of the people that are part of the webinar are familiar with. Um, uh, so we'll mention that briefly, just as a, a bit of a background. I want to share some of the network data uh, from most recent our report, um, specifically around depression, um, so that we understand uh, where we are as a network and how uh, we're, we're doing with this outcome. Um, we want to think about some of the issues um, that individuals are facing or that uh, practices are facing with um, uh, ICC in particular, uh, or in the postpartum period. Um, I, I do have some background slides related to um, some of the society recommendations and some new um, new um, uh, data which suggests that there are long-term effects of uh, maternal depression. And finally, I wanted to talk about uh, some of the effects of uh, the implicit network in terms of leading behavior change and um, how that might affect the rate of persistent depression um, for moms and families that we take care of um, uh, in the future. Um, everybody should be aware of what the implicit network is. Um, this is a uh, collaborative quality improvement network that was born out of the FMEC and um, has now um, been uh, going strong for over a decade. Um, uh, the initial approach uh, was to look at interventions, minimizing preterm and low birth weight infants using continuous improvement techniques. Um, that the first phase of that work was around prenatal care and trying to improve, uh, do quality improvement projects during the prenatal period. Um, in 2012, that shifted to a model looking at um, delivering care to mothers who bring their children in for well child visits and identifying some core risk factors that are known to be associated with preterm birth or low birth weight. And um, I'll mention that the, the newest phase of wh where this network is going is really trying to think around about um, wraparound care in the fourth trimester with the same type of uh, intensity uh, that we think about prenatal care um, and with some of the same um, tools and techniques that we use to sustain clinical change um, and um, to, to um, implement um, and overcome barriers at practice sites um, that we've done in other projects associated with the implicit network. 
Um, so some of the reason, um, you know, we'll mostly be talking about the um, ICC data today, and, um, and, and that's the largest current project that's going on for implicit. Um, and I wanted to re review the background and the rationale for, for why we do that. Um, while we know now that um, many mothers receive no care um, at all for themselves in between pregnancies, um, including no postpartum care or limited postpartum care, um, and most moms, um, particularly those at risk, are not seeking preconception care. Uh, we do know that those who have children are present um, at well child visits for their children, particularly in the first two years of life. Um, so it was a, a known um, area, an opportunity, a, a missed opportunity to um, where women are in the, in the office. It might be the same office where they're getting care. Uh, they're an attentive audience. Uh, they're willing to receive care and advice from their, their uh, child's physician or provider, um, and um, and we use this as, as an opportunity to implement a screening intervention around four topic areas, and we'll talk about what those are. Um, um, and um, and uh, review specifically the data and this and the um, uh, protocols around depression. So I'm going to uh, take over the next few slides. Uh, it's really great, first of all, to be able to talk, in, to, talk to you all. I uh, miss you all and wish I um, could do this more um, from the West Coast. It's just a little bit harder. But anyway, um, the, as you guys uh, all know, there are these four major areas of our ICC intervention that all of which were originally framed around associations with the increased risk of low birth weight and preterm birth. And those continue to be a, um, a good rationale for including them all together. Uh, these include um, different kind. We have different reasons for thinking that they might be related to preterm birth and low birth weight. Uh, smoking, depression, uh, and depression are both related to inflammatory states within the body, and that's the way scientifically people are, are generally thinking about that being related to preterm birth and low birth weight. Um, and the other two have other mechanisms, uh, family planning, birth spacing, you know, or short interconception intervals and uh, multivitamin folate use um, have other potential mechanisms, but they all are tied together that way. Um, depression, in, of course, that is an important uh, rationale. Um, the more immediate um, uh, issues that relate to the impact on both the mother and the family um, and uh, the child, uh, we know that from uh, robust evidence, and we'll review a little bit more about that, um, that uh, untreated depression is uh, highly impactful on uh, the develop growth and development, growth in countries where low, um, where calories are not so plentiful as they are generally in the U.S., um, but uh, development everywhere um, in the child. And uh, it's enough to have the suffering of the mother, of course, to motivate our um, our treatment of depression, but um, it's also impactful on children. Um, so our model, the ICC depression model, includes the uh, systematic screening of women, and um, we know from epidemiologic evidence that particularly among uh, vulnerable populations that the rates of depression prevalence are quite high. It is the most common disorder of pregnancy and, and postpartum. Um, at serious disorder of pregnancy and postpartum. Um, and um, as we see here, 20 to 40 um, percent uh, are known in many vulnerable populations to have that. Um, and this uh, overall rate, um, you know, and again, depends on the study you look at, but overall, um, you'll, you'll be, you can identify depression at least temp uh, for a short time, sometime in this uh, perinatal uh, air period, which we're thinking of pregnancy in the year postpartum to two years postpartum, um, as uh, being around 40%. So there are a number of different uh, approaches to taking to doing screening. Um, the the uh, way that uh, our implicit model, you know, suggested is uh, is potentially using the two-item screen from the PHQ-9 and then going on to the rest of the PHQ-9 if that uh, screen is positive, and then um, assessing for safety and severity of symptoms relating, um, being able to respond to uh, at least assess 
the severity of risk uh, immediately and by the, the provider who's doing the screening or is involved with the screening um, and not relying on um, other more uh, uh, highly, more specialized mental health providers in order to do that evaluation, things of that sort. Next slide. Um, so what, one of the things that is becoming more and more apparent that uh, it's just important for everyone to have on their radar screen is that um, suicide turns out if you include the frame which now the CDC is pushing um, and is uh, more states are through their maternal mortality review boards um, are looking into and this is quite new only within the last four or five years has, has there really been a, any kind of attention to this. Um, it's clear that it is a major cause of maternal mortality. In some studies, in some states um, with that are digging into this data, they're finding it to be the single most uh, common cause of maternal mortality, uh, which is um, interesting and important for us to pay attention to. Luckily, it is rare, um, but it is really important for us to be paying attention to this. Um, especially as we see the rates of suicidal ideation in the population in the country in general go up, particularly among younger populations, which are going to be coming through and being the, um, the majority of patients who will be having, um, having kids and, fa and growing families. So that is a really critical area for, um, for attention. The ninth item of the PHQ-9 and the tenth from the EPDS assess uh, as a screening item, um, thoughts of uh, self-harm and or initially just life is not worth living. Uh, and it's critical that we be able to be able uh, be able to, in our individual clinics, address that, as I was saying, in an efficient manner without disrupting the flow of care, uh, but at the same time uh, not ignoring that and having that go um, too, too quickly. Um, uh, um, I, would, I guess one other thing I'll just mention real quickly um, is that uh, the, uh, the, rate, the suicide rates are primarily from six months on. Um, so uh, there's actually a reduction in risk of, of suicide for women of the same age um, uh, overall in this period. So pregnancy in the first six months of, of postpartum, um, less than half of the suicides will occur in that time. Um, a half or more will occur from six months on, um, which really, um, you know, it, there's all kinds of potential reasons for that. Women putting off, you know, their uh, desperate feelings um, at, until it just over, overwhelms them. Um, but it also really reinforces the critical nature of this interconception period uh, for screening and treating. And, um, you know, when, if you, since most women who have depression postpartum already had it in pregnancy, um, it is critical that screening gets started then, um, you know, if you're taking care of the same patient. But certainly early in pregnancy and in a continued ongoing way that we uh, monitor this so that we deflect the trajectory that towards, um, towards suicide that, will, that happens later. So thanks very much. I think, Mario, you're going to take I, that I, back. Yeah, I, I think it also highlights um, that that really the, the time of birth is what starts the interconception period, as, as we're aware, and recognizing as we think more about fourth trimester and postpartum care, that these two periods are overlapped. And, um, and when we think about what the network has done and where we have opportunities to make a difference and to impact primary care and maternity care, um, for families, that this is an area of a high overlap um, for those two things. And as uh, Ian mentioned, it's, it's really the, the, the critical time to address, uh, you know, maternal depression or risk factors for maternal, persistent maternal depression um, and for suicidality. Um, so uh, trying to figure out ways to um, augment the care that we're already providing um, during that period um, should be a goal of our network. I did want to share a little bit about how, how we're doing. Um, and, um, and this is one thing that people, um, you know, rely on to get a, a, a sense of, you know, whether or not the ICC model is working. So um, we're going to go through a couple of slides that share network data across um, all of the um, sites that are participating um, and sharing data 
in REDCap. Um, so we have 19 different sites, I think, um, um, whose data has gone into um, what we'll share here. Um, and this is data over the last couple of years. Um, most of this data is phase two data. And uh, although many sites had transitioned in July to ICC phase three, um, because that's not universal, uh, any data that's captured in the phase three period has been down uh, coded to phase two um, results. And so uh, that shouldn't affect the screening rates that we're seeing here, but, um, but just to, to note that we're, uh, we are shifting in terms of the granularity of the data that will be collected moving forward. Um, so as you can um, you know, see and, and what's highlighted below is um, that the, uh, both the, uh, the risk, which means uh, women in this case with a positive uh, PHQ, uh, this is a positive PHQ-9 oh, actually, um, as well as uh, the intervention rates are variable across sites. Um, and part of that is driven by the N, um, so sites with smaller uh, numbers of patients overall or sites that have a lower um, positive risk um, are might be doing better with uh, you know the in, the screening uh, or intervention rate and sites that have a, a larger population larger volume more women that screen positive um, it's harder to uh, hit the intervention rate 100% um, but I think this data is very promising in terms of um, the percent intervention for women who are screening positive the the downside of the the data here is that um, there is a lot um, of non documentation. Um, and so you can take a look in the um, number of the absolute number of women screened, um, those that um, you know are have a positive risk um, uh, demonstrated here, and those that um, had an opportunity for an intervention. The gap there, uh, where intervention is missing, um, you see 1763, is really where there isn't documentation about whether or not that was that was provided. So, um, so we have a better uh, job to do in terms of documenting what we're doing. Um, but when we have documented that an intervention was either performed or not performed, um, you know, we, it seems to um, be happening over 90% of the time. Um, just to uh, give, if, I, um, if I can mention one thing real quick uh, about that data, Mario, sorry, just to interrupt real quick. Um, one thing that, to remember also is that given the majority of the populations that we're taking care of, um, so, uh, the low po screen positive rates that we're seeing are a symptom that normally indicates that we're, we have some improvement to do on how well we're screening also. So it's something to, to keep thinking about within, although we've got 90% of folks who are screening positive getting something, you know, there's something happening there, um, we're probably missing a large proportion of people who, um, you know, could also have been uh, positive. Um, we minimally expect 10%, um, and for many of our practices, we'd expect closer to 20% um, screen positive. So that's, um, you know, just a, a reminder that that is also something to, in your PDSA cycles, in your clinics, to consider, you know, how exactly is the delivery of that screening happening? Because ICC is performed um, across a two-year period, um, we want to get a sense of you know, where this is happening and when we're capturing women. Um, this doesn't show incident data, but does show the prevalent data across um, uh, women in that 24-month uh, time period. Um, and similar to many of the risk factors um, that we see, there is a consistency across uh, the, the, two, the first two years. Um, and the, uh, the, the data on the right um, is the data that um, projects to the graph that's on the left, demonstrating that the um, prevalence rate for um, depression is um, somewhere between six and a half and um, nine percent, um, really just across the board um, from um, the first few months postpartum um, all the way up until 24 months. And we'll see that there is some, uh, there tends to be a, in our data, it shows that there's a little bit of a spike around um, 12 to 18 months in that time period. I don't know if that projects to you know uh, national data in in any way, or if it is re a reflection of um, the the N um, or the data that's collected or the quality of the data that's collected uh, across the network. But our, uh, we do see that there tends to be a peak effect um, around 12 to 15 months. Um, 
This data, again, is also network data. Um, you can see the, the large N um, uh, representing um, the number of well child visits, um, in this case, uh, looking at 72,000 um, you know, data points that are part of the REDCap database. Um, when um, all considered, uh, we're looking at about a 7.2% uh, screen positive for uh, maternal depression during well child visits. Um, that represents 10% of all moms who had a screen documented, but we still see that over a quarter of the data is missing, and so there's opportunity for improvement there. Um, when, in fact, a PHQ-2 is positive, um, we'd like to know if the PHQ-9 um, is also positive. Um, and so uh, just screening positive for um, the PHQ-2 alone is, is not sufficient um, uh, to really characterize the pre prevalence um, or intensity of maternal depression. Uh, looking at the PHQ-9 data, we see that about 42% of moms who screened positive with a PHQ-2 also had a PHQ-9 that we would consider positive in this data set. Um, and that number is, um, I think, pretty consistent over time. Uh, in terms of the across the implicit network and consistent with um, um, other studies related to um, the uh, likelihood of having a positive PHQ-9 um, for moms that screen positive or for anybody that screens positive using a PHQ-2. Um, and then finally, um, on the bottom, we can go back one. Um, these are, um, this is data related uh, not to screening, but whether or not an intervention uh, was in place or provided. Um, and re recalling that this is really um, phase two data. So the, uh, the data that we have that feeds into um, this scenario is uh, whether or not a, an intervention was provided without regard to the characteristic of that intervention, the quality or the intensity of the intervention. And phase three, um, ICC data collection will have a, a, an ability to get more granular in terms of identifying what type of interventions are making a difference. But uh, for right now, um, this data suggests either an intervention was performed or not performed. Um, and uh, when a, uh, the depression risk was positive, um, with a positive PHQ-9, an intervention was performed 87% um, of the time. Um, uh, and that's uh, of, all the, of all the data um, for um, just the known uh, outcomes when uh, it was documented that a that something was either performed or not performed, um, it's actually 92% of the time. Um, so the truth probably lies somewhere in between those two numbers. Uh, I just did want to take a minute to, um, you know, I think on the next screen we'll uh, we'll try to identify a little bit of um, barriers um, or challenges that have been present in um, in, in in implementing screening. Uh, strategies at uh, residency practices. Um, but these were some that, um, you know, I think that have come out over time, either at our practice or across the network. Um, when we think about how to screen for depression, when to do that, and in what capacity, um, there are some institutional barriers that make that, that difficult, um, including provider time, resources, and um, in some cases, access to uh, mental health services. Um, certainly, if you're going to screen for depression, you have to have an ability to act on it. Um, and if you're going to screen for suicidality, you have to have the ability to provide services um, immediately um, or have a, an arrangement to refer um, patients for necessary services. And so those might pr present a barrier uh, to some practices, hopefully not many, um, but certainly we all um, experience a limited access to behavior health in general. Um, and then uh, as we saw with some of the data, um, one of the challenges that we do need to overcome is how we get these interventions documented into the chart. Um, insurance can be a barrier, too, um, as we think about um, uh, how patients are covered for mental health services and whether that can be part um, of their practice or integrated within their practice um, or whether or not they have separate coverage and where that coverage might be and how they access it. Um, and then uh, we're thinking about, um, you know, how uh, at a state level um, uh, payers are, are paying for maternal depression screening and how institutions are um, figuring out how to um, bill for those services and receive payment for those. And certainly some advocacy needs to be done around payment reform for maternal depression screening to make that a more universal part of um, the payment structure um, for both pediatric um, and for maternity care follow-up. So uh, before going on, I just wanted to give a chance to see if um, any of these things were ringing um, uh, uh, true at your practice sites and whether or not you've encountered 
barriers like this um, or different barriers and um, maybe to have uh, a couple examples of how these are being overcome to increase screening or intervention rates across the network. Hey, this is Lisa. Um, thanks uh, so much for doing this talk. Um, it's excellent. Um, one of the biggest challenges and we're We've done so many PDSA cycles trying to increase our rate of screening depression because we know for a fact that it doesn't match not only the national rates, but our local rates also. And so we did a focus group with our nurses who do the PHQ-2, and they feel that women are embarrassed and don't answer honestly. And I don't know if anyone else has encountered that. And so we're trying to figure out in our system that is trying to go digital and electronic if we should be having women in a private space fill out their PHQ-2 and then turn it over if it's positive for a nine, which would be going backwards electronically. But I don't know if somebody else has had any other ideas to increase that rate. We tried just handing them the sticker, which is what we have on our, our when they first check in and have the moms fill it out, but it's sort of on a clipboard and it's in front of everybody. So I don't know how much, how private that is, but. I'm wondering if that's true or if Ian's experiences is that given that environment, would moms underestimate their depression? Uh, I'd love to hear uh, others. I mean, I, I um, it, it is a stigma is a huge issue in mental health in general. Um, and there's an added stigma related to the, um, you know, the, the uh, perfect mom kind of ideas that uh, most cultures have. Um, that mothers will do anything um, to treat, uh, to take care of their mother, their children, and mental health is, you know, gets in the way of that, so that wouldn't be acceptable within that kind of categorization. Um, so I, you know, it's a, it's a great question. There's no um, real answers to that. Um, certainly, finding ways to um, have the uh, exploring ways, and that, I think all of us. This is what one thing that's really cool about. Uh, having a group working on this is everyone try innovative ways of overcoming these solutions. Just give it a try, see what it does, you know, see how people uh, respond to that. You know, a really nice PDSA where the, the focus group is great, uh, but then follow it up with like some kind of modification and trial it. Um, and maybe just with a couple of your uh, nurses, you know, in, in a smaller part of your practice, um, see if that seems to be making a difference. Um, and then, you know, if it's not, then <laughs> try something else. Um, and there's, yeah, as we know now from our learning, our ideas about a learning health system, you never stop working on enhancing your services, right? That you stop and you're like a shark and you drown. Um, you just have to uh, keep moving. That is an integral part of uh, our care. Um, so, you know, um, that's that would be my main suggestion. I really look forward to hearing about uh, people's uh, experiences and ideas. We we can move on, and there might be some time at the end if um, if something um, becomes part of uh, you know. Uh, an area that you want to focus on, but Lisa, I'll I'll share that um, in our in our clinical practice, we we do the rooming outside of the room and in a public space, and there's only a curtain. And you know, this is not just you know maternity care or at well child visits, but you know anybody that's getting a PHQ two is is a bit out in the open. And you know, now that we're doing that, you know, a, a larger proportion of the time, I think we're trying to refine that process and try to figure out how to do that in a more you know accurate and private way. Um, of course. You know, in, in this model, um, in my in our practice, we you know have providers really ask moms, and um, um, and and uh, the MAs are not asking moms at well child visits. Uh, it's still pro provider driven in our practice, um, and so um, it eliminates some of what you mentioned. But how to automate that, like we've done for other things, um, and and doing that in a way where we get the true result and um, and that that's patient centered and private uh, will be important moving forward. Okay. So I, I just wanted to shift gears a little bit and talk about something which um, we all know to be the case and, and which, you know, we, we signed up to maybe hear and talk more about. But, um, you know, recognizing that um, as we've made improvements in maternity care um, and yet 
um, despite better medical care, we see cases of um, women suffering in the postpartum period, um, you know, um, maternal stigma and, um, and uh, increasing rates of suicide. Um, we do need to recognize that addressing depression um, uh, for women um, who are in the reproductive years is critically important. It's important for them, it's important for their children, it's important for their pregnancies and for the outcomes. It's important for the developmental um, success of their children and their families as well. And so um, thinking about, um, you know, uh, that being really the cornerstone of the family, um, this is an opportunity for us, those of us that do family health um, to really make a, an important difference. And I think to really um, uh, make a significant impact in the maternity care crisis that we, um, that we currently um, uh, are experiencing. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about kind of who's on board with this and what the recommendations are and, um, and kind of where we might be going as a whole in terms of medicine. So a ACOG is on board with us. Um, ACOG has come out with a campaign in the last year or two to really um, uh, emphasize and advertise the, um, the rate of uh, depression for pregnant women and, and women who are postpartum. Um, they recognize that this is um, you know, as important as other medical care that women receive. And part of the ACOG recommendations, both for prenatal care and for postpartum care, include screening for depression using a validated tool, as well as screening for us other social determinants and social stressors. And so, um, you know, we're really looking to try to align what they're doing, what we're doing, um, and, and really um, try to uh, figure out the, the best strategy and, and time period um, to implement um, screening um, in, in for women uh, along the spectrum. Um, in terms of prevalence, we, we do understand that, um, you know, the lifetime prevalence for adults in the United States is somewhere around 17 to 19 percent. Um, obviously, there's a, you know, a much greater uh, prevalence than women in the United States, um, than, but there uh, is, you know, a phenomenon for depression in men um, and, um, you know, postpartum. Um, men are experiencing depression at increasing rates as well, um, which is not necessarily being addressed by, by what we're uh, our models about, but uh, it's certainly something um, that we are aware and should consider. Um, the annual prevalence for you know depression is you know somewhere around you know four, four to eight percent um, um, in the United States, and um, and this is probably true for most developed countries as well, um, with differing rates um, in in the developing world. And so um, uh, this is something that we definitely um, have recognized to be the case. We know it to be the case, um, and uh, and we see it really pronounced. Um, in the reproductive years. Um, when we think particularly about postpartum depression, um, you know, point prevalence rates is, you know, estimated anywhere from 10 to 20 percent. Um, but it's really, you know, to, to think about where that depression um, starts is, is important. Um, for um, many of the people that I train and for families that I work with um, and for the practices themselves, um, they're, they're really kind of honing in on postpartum depression as incident depression, but that's not the case for the majority of women. Now, for the majority of women who experience postpartum depression, um, it's really starting either prior to pregnancy or during pregnancy. And so most part of postpartum depression is not really postpartum, but was really pre present in the second and third trimester. Uh, and so our screening strategies in well women care and during prenatal care are important and setting the stage for, um, you know, preparing for postpartum depression and making sure that we're minimizing impact to women and providing ma maximum opportunities for treatment. For women who do have incidental postpartum depression, the majority starts in the first month. Um, and when you think about um, the traditional model of postpartum care, where women deliver, are discharged, and then have a, um, a visit um, at the, their OBGYN provider um, at six weeks, they're really missing the, the opportunity to capture that um, as well as completely missing the opportunity to help and to support women through the uh, period of baby blues, which is generally the first two weeks uh, following delivery. Um, as um, Ian had mentioned earlier, uh, related to suicidality, uh, this is really peaking in the first few months postpartum, um, but the incidence continues into that first year as well. Um, but most women who develop postpartum depression will have that um, be present in the first four months following delivery, um, and we'll see some more um, in the in the five to twelve month period as well. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about the implicit network and um, some of the data that we have where we've um, identified you know a, a similar proportion of women who um, didn't have depression in the first year but did screen positive for depression um, in the the second year of their child's life from twelve to twenty four months, and um, that's an interesting phenomenon as well. Um, the graphic on the on the side. Um, 
um, you know, really kind of tries to capture um, that when you're taking care of women in this period, it's really just a, a continuum, um, not uh, really an isolated period of antepartum or postpartum, um, but really kind of preconception during pregnancy, postpartum, and in that interconception period as well. You can go, Ma. Um, so wh why is this important? Um, I think we understand that, you know, maternal depression has an effect um, on maternity care and, and directly on, on the pregnancy. Um, it can affect, um, you know, nutrition and, um, and uh, health status. Um, obviously, there's a risk for suicidal behavior, both um, during pregnancy and immediately afterwards. Anhedonia and enga engagement in things, including medical care, is really important and not adherence to the things that we've suggested, you know, as simple as prenatal vitamins, but maybe as much as, um, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy or um, important medications for um, organic medical conditions. All of that stuff could be, um, you know, affected um, in, in moms who are suffering, experiencing depression or depression symptoms, even if it's not been diagnosed. Um, we recognize um, that there's good data to support that depression could have negative effects on neonates. Um, it can affect um, pregnancies and pregnancy outcomes, um, including preterm birth. Um, it can increase the rate of operative delivery. Um, and moms who are depressed have a, a higher discontinuation of breastfeeding. What's new and interesting and, and uh, I think needs to be updated uh, across the network is that there's other um, developmental um, uh, milestones and, um, and achievements that are affected in families uh, who are affected with maternal depression. Um, and that includes infant mortality or the, um, the prevalence of SIDS in the home, um, physical health problems for child as they grow, um, other um, neurofunctioning or cognitive development. Um, and we'll see some data that this is, um, you know, can perhaps affect children even into their teen years and can affect the mental health of the offspring for moms who are suffering from persistent maternal depression. Um, and so really across the life cycle, this is a chance to, to intervene um, when it comes to mental health and family. Um, this is um, the, a, a paper that some of you have um, heard or seen. Um, it's really um, just about a, a year or two old now um, from Nessie that was published in JAMA Psychiatry. Um, they looked at persistent maternal depression. So moms that screened positive for depression really in the first six months and then also um, I think at two points in the first eight months of um, following delivery. Um, and they followed um, these moms as well as the offspring for a, a substantial period of time. So we really have some prospective um, data um, from, from this project. And I think that's why the results are really um, you know, transformative um, for me in terms of thinking about the, the effect of maternal depression on family health. Um, so um, they identified that maternal depression increased the risk for behavioral disturbance um, in children, whether that was persistent or not persistent. But the real um, data um, is, is about whether or not those you know, um, behavioral problems um, or um, effects persisted in the children or the offspring of moms affected by depression. And in fact, they were. So it's hard to really hone in on what outcomes or metrics to look at. They did look at behavioral problems and found that they persisted. And there was an increased um, association with those even um, at age three and a half. Um, they identified lower math uh, grades and overall school performance at age 16, um, and there was a higher prevalence of depression in the children of um, mothers who were affected by persistent maternal depression even at age 18. Um, moms who had persistent depression also were more likely to have ongoing depression as well. Um, so um, this data, you know, is, is substantial, um, but it, you know, needs to be um, resolved in the larger context and um, understand other factors that contribute to, um, you know, uh, neurocognitive development and overall family health as well, but certainly um, support uh, interve increased intervention for moms um, and families that are suffering with maternal depression. Yeah, and if I can just add a couple of things to that, um, you know, that this was controlling for a genetic, you know, increased risk. Um, so this is, that increased uh, risk is on top of just kind of familial uh, increased risk for depression. Um, and um, so, you know, that sometimes people think about, you know, well, it's because of a genetic issue, but that, that is, is, is considered and controlled for there. You go ahead, Ma. <clears throat> we mentioned that, um, that most of our societies that we rely on are on board with maternal depression screening, and um, most of us uh, understand this and practice this. Um, ACOG certainly supports this. Um, in their bulletin in 2015, we'll see that. Um, they recommended doing this in the postpartum period as well. That was a reaffirmation 
um, using any any tool that we feel is, is appropriate. The AASP recommends screening um, just generally for adults, including pregnant postpartum women. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics really about 10 years ago um, recommended doing an Edinburgh um, at well child visits at one, two, four, and six months, um, which, you know, is, uh, as, as we understand, is, is not well implemented. Um, the American College of Preventive Medicine recommends that we do this, and so does the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. Go ahead. Um, this is just, you know, um, mostly for reference, but this is the ACOG committee opinion from um, 2015 about screening for depression um, at, at least once in the prenatal period. Um, that's about as far as they would go um, using whatever validated tool that uh, was appropriate and worked with office workflows. Go ahead. Um, this is the 2018 opinion and really kind of what's at the, you know, the stage for us to think about a, a larger kind of fourth trimester um, project um, about how we can um, really revolutionize the postpartum period and think about it not as a single point in time, but really as a spectrum of care that focuses on the diet. Um, including addressing kind of uh, social, psychosocial factors and well-being for mothers. Um, this is a 2010 um, publication from the American Academy of Pediatrics, which recommends um, uh, maternal depression screening at well child visits at those intervals in the first few months following birth. And the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, which um, makes general recommendations about screening for depression in adults, but has a specific um, recommendation around pregnancy um, in terms of um, using a validated screen for women during pregnancy as well as postpartum. Um, and of course, our, our own American Academy of Family Physicians recommends um, that we screen um, in general um, and that we should at least screen once during the, pre the perinatal period, which is consistent with the ACOG recommendation. I'm going to uh, take over. Is this where you wanted me to um, start, yeah, uh, Mario? Yeah, this is great, Ian. Yeah. Okay. So just um, that now, uh, Mario, is this data from our own um, our own uh, network or from elsewhere? No, this is just the literature. Yeah. So just to uh, review, because uh, it is, you know, there there are a lot of screening instruments out there, and a lot of um, different. Uh, folks like the, the pediatricians, of course, are looking to their own, um, and the, the obstetricians are looking to their own specialty recommendations for picking a tool. Um, one of the things that, of course, as providers of women in, in and out of pregnancy and through their life course, um, it is uh, critical to be consistent, to reduce the opportunity to um, to be confusing about, you know, the instruments that are being being used. And so I, I, for that reason, um, I've always been really interested in seeing how well the PHQs do um, as compared to the Edinburgh, which was developed at a time when we thought, when we didn't know and assumed that the symptoms of pregnancy and postpartum, actually postpartum, because it was originally designed for um, the, the six weeks postpartum for use in that period uh, when um, now quite a long time ago. Um, and there are, uh, it's important to see here that in fact the PHQ2 and PHQ9 perform quite well um, and um, arguably in some studies overall better um, as a screening tool. Um, but I would argue for the, um, the fact that they are equivalent, um, that the, in fact for sensitivity and specificity um, the, the overwhelming evidence is that the, these are uh, just as good as each other at, at identifying women with depression. Um, there are some um, are, who argue that the EPDS may do a little bit better about anxiety, which is definitely something to consider and, uh, you know, something to keep talking about. But the, uh, the amount, the other reasons to use the PHQ-9 is the uh, high volume of evidence related to not just screening, but monitoring progress. So the Edinburgh has never been assessed for its ability to monitor improvement in symptoms, whereas the PHQ-9 is um, very well established as, uh, as a target for monitoring people as they go forward with treatments to improve. Um, so for all of those reasons, I think, um, you know, from if there's a choice, um, then it's more efficient to go for the PHQ-2, PHQ-9, and, and uh, if you're going to do the PHQ-2, um, I think you should do PHQ-9 as part of it. Um, and then, but the EPDS is certainly fine to do as a screener, 
Once you start treating, you should use the PHQ-9, though. Next slide. Um, so, um, you know, there, there are a, a bunch of different um, things, and this is data from our work, just showing that, in fact, um, you know, the, if you're thinking about uh, whether or not the, um, the using a PHQ-2 would make it more effective for you um, to actually implement and sustain, then there's, uh, we've shown as part using implicit data, and that's consistent with what other people have done as well, um, that the uh, PHQ-2 works well as a um, as a uh, initial pre-screen. Your likelihood of missing people who would, will end up being positive is very low. Um, there are plenty of people who just use the PHQ-9 though for reasons of reimbursement for uh, screening, and that depends on your particular insurance climate. Next screen. Um, so you know th this is um, and. Um, um, Mario, is this uh, these slides are those that you we, want me to cover? Well, we we just wanted to, to reinforce that the, um, the the really the cycle of uh, you know entering into and out of pregnancy and um, and what we would consider the interconception care period are really um, uh, really just part of a spectrum. Um, and whether you use the Edinburgh or the PHQ two or nine um, or what your workflow is, um, thinking about women. Um, being somewhere in the spectrum is, is su super important to recognize both the risk factors um, that might contribute to depressive symptomatology as well as the prevalence and increased rate of um, depression um, or those symptoms for women who are experiencing really any part of the pathway along this period. And so, um, you know, as we think about um, kind of stepping back away from just pregnancy care or just fourth trimester care or just interconception care, thinking about holistic care for women kind of really across the spectrum, I think it's and I'm super important to, um, you know, consider that this is really a long period of time. Go ahead. Great. Um, um, there, go ahead, there are Mario. Some, uh, yeah, question. yeah. There, there are some, um, you know, I, I think want to kind of bridge into uh, what some of our data has shown um, in the interconception care period in terms of maternal depression screening, but also um, what our, our work has, you know, really shown in kind of this postpartum um, uh, period or what we would consider, you know, the interconception care period really extending um, all the way from the time of delivery until the time of the next birth or what we focus on is in those first 24 months following the delivery in the ICC model. And so, um, you know, as, as you can see, and as everybody on the um, call is probably aware, you know, that this, um, you know, the idea of having a validated, um, you know, depression screen um, and to, to implement that and to show that there's feasibility of doing that at well child visits. Um, is really a you know a major premise for um, the work that goes into our um, ICC model. Go ahead. Um, and then thinking about kind of the data for interconception care, uh, obviously we we um, believe it. We've we've um, signed up to do it. We've you know been experimenting with this for over five years, um, and we have some really great data to show the work that we've been doing. Um, but you know we're, we're not alone to recognize um, that interconception care, which was previously ungoogleable, you know, five years ago, it was something that nobody is talking about is now um, really being um, discussed as a major time period and as a major strategy um, from this, the WHO, the CDC, um, and from some of the major funders in the NIH, including the NISHTI. Um, and so, uh, but we're seeing this really um, all over the place um, being recognized as an opportunity. Um, this, is a this is a study that came out of the Netherlands um, that looked at, um, uh, follow-up um, care at well child visits and um, kind of uh, in a quasi-experimental approach, um, women were randomized um, essentially to either receive an intervention, which is a kind of a battery of, de you know, depression screening um, and a referral if they were positive versus the routine care that they were getting. Um, and what's interesting about this study is that women who received the screening um, and were referred to, you know, specialty mental health at a separate site um, had lower rates of maternal depression um, compared to the you know, control group that got the standard of care um, without regard to whether or not they actually arrived um, and received any of that um, care that they were referred to. So um, you know, there, there, to some degree that this is a, you know, a question of whether or not the systems that are in place and the processes are, you know, really work 
um, and you know, perhaps the act of screening um, and recognizing that there's some depressive symptomatology and the conversation that happens at the time of referral are in fact even an intervention. Go ahead. You can go ahead, Ma. Um, and then we recognize, um, you know, some of our, our own um, uh, leaders and uh, colleagues that have worked on the ICC model, um, you know, within the network, um, able to publish some of this data about the effectiveness, the feasibility um, of doing depression depression screening um, at well child visits in the first um, in the first two months. And uh, we'd like to share in the last couple of slides um, whether or not. Um, you know, that there's some positive results or what we can derive from the data um, that we have been collecting over the last few years. Okay. This was a paper that was the SDFM paper of the year in 2018 um, from um, Sakanya and the, the rest of the leadership team at, um, at Implicit. Okay. Um, and then uh, just in the just to, to mention um, that um, one of the confounding uh, features of women in this uh, period of time and what we would consider the fourth trimester, the beginning of interconception care, is that, um, that there's a lot of struggles that women are experiencing in that time, including a recovery from delivery and um, some um, you know, changes in uh, hormone levels, which may precipitate postpartum depression or baby blues. Um, understanding that um, breastfeeding is one of the most common symptoms or symptoms related to breastfeeding, sore nipples or painful nipples or chapped nipples um, um, or pain um, are one of the most common uh, symptoms that are rep reported in that uh, time period. Um, and that that can affect uh, women's experience with depression or, um, or similar symptoms, as well as other um, support strategies, including um, access to care and uh, sleep rest um, that may um, be uh, effectively um, used as coping strategies uh, for women in that time period. Um, so recognizing that this can be a risk factor um, as well as an, uh, a barrier towards effective depression care, um, but that treatment for depression um, should uh, continue regardless of whether moms are breastfeeding in this time period, um, and that we should be aware that most of the strategies that we normally use when we um, use pharmacotherapy for depression um, are uh, safe and effective while breastfeeding, um, and certainly we would think about using SSRIs primarily as a first line treatment for women who are breastfeeding. Um, so the, the last couple of slides as we wrap up are really wanted to, um, uh, and I thank Mike Horst for um, sharing this data, um, but this is really trying to get a deeper dive into the uh, ICC data set um, and looking at um, what we've done with depression screening um, in the, for moms that we've been tracking um, for at least two years. Um, and so um, looking at the entire um, you know, database of um, 16,000 mom baby dyads representing almost 59,000 well child visits, um, really tried to kind of hone in on a sample, a small um, uh, sample of moms that have um, had depression screening at least once in the first year of life. And again, in the second year of life, when um, you know a child was coming in for somewhere between a 12 and 24 month visit, um, and um, uh, and as you can see, that that um, that number is is much smaller. But we are looking at a pretty sizable sample of um, over 3,500 mom-child dyads representing 23,000 well-child visits. I'd like to point out a couple things about this this data, um, and which you know um, is really. Um, network-wide without controlling for the site um, that the data was coming from um, or without controlling for the exact child's age, since this is really kind of a one data point in the first year and one data point in the second year. Um, but when compared to the reference group, which is a negative depression screen um, at the initial well-child visit, um, you know, moms um, who uh, do screen positive in the first year of life uh, do have an increased odds of um, screening positive on a maternal depression screen um, in year two, um, which would be a child of, you know, between 12 and 24 months of age. Um, so um, if they uh, had a positive PHQ-2 um, that was then confirmed with a positive Q PHQ-9 um, and no intervention um, was, you know, performed, um, you know, or documented in the chart, the odds ratio of um, having depression uh, a positive depression screen with a PHQ-9 um, in the second year was 3.32. Um, 
Interestingly, um, you know, we see that moms um, that are in that same situation uh, for whom an intervention was performed, um, the odds ratio of um, having depression in, in the second year was lower, although um, still higher than the referent group. And um, although it is lower, it's not statistically lower uh, or statistically significantly lower than um, that moms that received no intervention. And there's a lot of reasons um, that, that that may not be um, statistically significant, but um, the, the data are compelling that, um, that there is probably some benefit of offering an intervention for moms in, in that group. We should recognize that um, a limitation of our data set is that the intervention rates are exceedingly high. Um, so when we look back, we saw an intervention rate somewhere between 88 and 92 percent. And so the N in the smaller group, um, uh, moms who had a positive PHQ2 confirmed with a PHQ9 but had no intervention, um, is, uh, is, has, was, is actually substantially smaller. Um, so even um, if we were able to detect a difference, it would be hard to have the study um, or this data be powered enough to show that that difference is statistically significant. Another limitation of this data is that we're really looking at phase two data, um, which shows that an intervention was performed without regard to the quality or the intensity of that intervention. Um, and so we should have some better data at some point in the future when we can look back and look at phase three ICC data. Yeah, and I guess I'd, I'd just add one thing. Um, uh, my view um, of this is that, you know, we're, it's great that we're doing these processes of care, but this is evidence from my perspective that we have room to go, you know, in terms of uh, in, in trying to reduce the, it, it just indicates that the interventions that we're doing, we still have women who are likely to need to be identified again and have interventions continue. So that's the big thing is that we, we're not one and done. Um, and that's what's so great about, um, about ICC and implicit is that we are, we are following these women forward. Um, and there's the question about do we want to implement some kind of procedures to, um, you know, keep them at, up more on the top of our list if they were positive before rather than waiting for them to screen positive again. And I don't know what if anyone in the clinic in the network is doing that. Um, this is another interesting finding that really came from that, and it speaks to I think understanding what the prevalence is, and also uh, of, of depression for moms in the postpartum period, but also recognizing um, kind of that women are at some point in the spectrum of the life cycle. Um, you know, we did identify that, you know, that there was a small subgroup of women who did, did not have a positive depression screen in year one, um, who screened negative, but did screen positive um, in year two. Um, and about 7% of uh, moms who received a depression screen in year two um, did have a positive um, uh, result there. And so, uh, you know, I, I, while there is a focus of, the, of both the fourth trimester, um, the immediate postpartum care, um, you know, and the higher incidence of postpartum depression in those first few months following delivery, um, I think we do need to recognize that there's an unmet need. Um, now, this is data that comes from our model, which is to screen moms at well child visits, but for most moms that are receiving traditional care, they've, they're outside of their maternity care at this point and, and, and really would be hopefully engaged on primary care alone. Um, so I think that this type of um, data serves as, you know, really affirming for our model which looks at moms and follows them through the first two years of life, um, you know, um, of, of their child's life, uh, and, and um, would have the ability to identify incident depression, even in a lower prevalence um, situation for moms that didn't seem like they otherwise had risk based on their prior history. Um, below that, we see a couple of the drivers that, you know, might be associated here, um, less than a high school um, ed education um, seem to be a driver for persistent depression. Um, you know, certainly medical assistance compared to private, um, you know, insurance or, you know, um, was probably a driver. Interestingly, white race um, uh, was, um, you know, seemed to be a bit associated compared to non-white, but also so was being Hispanic as well. So I think this is, we're just limited by some of the demographic um, and, you know, maternal demographic limitations that the network is plagued with. Um, but, you know, we see some of these things which are really not all that, you know, surprising um, from the network level. And the, the last thing we did want to share is just um, this next slide, Maha, um, which shows, you know, um, kind of this information in a, in a graphical representation, um, you know, demonstrating, you know, kind of what, um, 
you know, where moms um, start to screen positive and the likelihood of screening positive in the subsequent year um, based on kind of how they screened in the first year. So moms that um, in the first set of, um, you know, bar graphs on the left, moms that screen negative in year one were, you know, overwhelmingly likely to screen negative in year, in year two. Moms that had a positive PHQ2, but no PHQ9 or their PHQ9 was negative, um, you know, there, there was a, you know, it uh, looks like a 33% of those moms did have um, some sort of, um, you know, positive, um, you know, at least a positive PHQ2 and maybe a positive PHQ9 in, in year two. And moms that we knew um, had a documented PHQ9 um, in year one, um, you know, really we're looking at 40% of those moms at least having a PHQ2 that's positive in year two. So, um, you know, uh, this, this data supports that, um, that there are risks for depression, you know, which are, you know, pre present even after the immediate postpartum period um, and really kind of long-term care and um, supportive intervention strategies should be present, you know, really across the continuum um, for women in that situation. And, and I think the implicit network is set up in a way um, to continue to screen and identify that and provide interventions at multiple time points um, for families that are in that situation. Um, I think it's um, probably time that we um, um, just end. Um, and um, if there's any questions, I think we can, um, you know, ha hang on the line and, and answer them. But I think that this is this that is it's it's quite promising um, in terms of what we're what we're doing as a network as, and and our vision, um, as well as the opportunity to answer some critical questions. Um, you know, based on the, the size and, and data that's available in our network and that we'll be able to parse out a little bit more about what's working um, once we um, have uh, more clarity with the ICC phase three data. Is there anyone who has any questions about what we've uh, been discussing? I, I know we're over time, so hopefully there are a few people left. Well, Mario, I think that, um, you know, we uh, one thing I know we've been working uh, with folks across the network on turning that, these results into uh, scholarly products that can help um, others working in this area head towards uh, other clinics and other uh, primary care sites, move towards implementing some of these um, procedures. Um, so, um, you know, that that's one thing is, you know, making sure that anyone on the line or in the network who's interested um, should reach out to, I believe you're leading um, that, that work, some of that work anyway, and others are too, um, to, just to reach out to us so that we can get them involved with that analysis and, and presentations and, you know, making sure that data gets disseminated to their own site. Hey, it's Corey. Hi. I just have one. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hey, I just had one uh, question, and that was in the past, I think we had talked a little bit about, sorry, it's Corey Fogelman from Lancaster. We had talked a little bit in the past about adding other questions or, or um, uh, potentially other parameters to the uh, interconception care. Um, I don't know if you guys had uh, talked about that in, in leadership uh, meetings or so forth. One thing I had thought about uh, recently was I noticed that the AAP uh, uh, fourth trimester uh, screening recommendations included a suggestion that we screen the uh, mother's partner for depression at six months. And um, I, I wondered if uh, ICC was an opportunity for us to implement that. I know sometimes we have fathers present for the well child checks. And of course, you know, the, the provider you know, clicks the no button, mother is not present, and then doesn't do interconception care, and it occurs to me that we could be uh, missing an opportunity there as well. Yeah, it's a great point, Corey. I mean, we've always, because of the framework around reduced preterm birth and lo low birth weight, um, we've focused in on the, the mom, um, but, um, but you know, I, I think that uh, each individual member of the network should consider um, Doing some of that work and reporting back, and, um, and I think everyone would be really interested in, in hearing about that. Yeah, 
Great. And thank you guys. I, I, I appreciate I, your going over this data for us. It was very helpful. And I, I agree, Corey. It seems like every, every year somebody is, is interested in trying to identify a little bit more about, um, you know, paternal depression and um, and and coping strategies, and um, both from a pediatric, you know, framework as well as from a maternity care support framework. And um, so I, I think that there's opportunities there, and, and we've never, you know, really explored it. But I um, and I'm not sure that uh, modif we did not discuss modifying the four factors in ICC to include. Um, any additional things, including that, but um, um, you know, I I don't dis disagree that it is something that could be included in kind of the the normal templated six month well child visit and other you know AAP you know recommendations. Was that Lisa who was uh, chiming in too, or somebody else? Uh, no, I, th this is Maha. I just wanted to um, see if anybody had any other additional questions. So I think the fundamental thing is just to go right to the PQ, PHQ-9, if at all possible, or a longer screen so we pick up more people. There are a lot of, there are a lot of clinics. That, is that Sakanya? Yes. Hi, guys. Hi, Sakanya. Um, uh, there are a lot of um, folks who are just going to the PHQ-9 because of, de depending on um, where they're getting payments for re and reimbursements for the screening, um, some uh, will require the PHQ-9, and there are also quality metrics that are related to that. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, in cases, uh, that's one reason to go to the straight PHQ-9. There's also... Um, you know, some evidence that we will be missing some people who have suicidal ideation. If you go there, there are a percentage, um, and so there, some folks are doing the PHQ-3, um, you know, adding the ninth question. Um, and then there's just the issues around workflow. If you're, you know, it might end up being better to have people, especially if they're right, if they're doing it on a clipboard on their own, and then you're going over it later. Um, with a provider or a medical assistant or a nurse, whoever might be doing it, um, you know that's uh, there's a lot of considerations in there. Um, if you wanted to do the PHQ-2, though, there is evidence that that is uh, perfectly fine to do. So it's you know each site will have to figure out what they want to do with that. Yeah. Well, we have this whole huddle system, and we have sometimes co-scheduled, not co-scheduled, but like I'm precepting, but there's also the FM psych person. And she basically just goes through a list and says, do PHQ-9, 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 PHQ-9. Mm -hmm. so I don't see why yeah. I, I, instead of saying do ICC, I say PHQ-9. Yeah. Because the, well, the MAs somebody, in this practice, well, in this practice yeah. are very attuned to doing the PHQ-9 a lot. Right. Once you have a specialty person in there, it's hard for them to know what to do without the PHQ-9. So, you know, if you mm -hmm. get a positive PHQ-2, you absolutely... I mean, I think you definitely need to follow that up with a PHQ-9 um, if you're going to actually, you know, dive into treatment. Um, so if you're mm -hmm. using the PHQ-2 alone, uh, you know, without a follow-up, then, yeah, I, I would say that uh, that would be the least de desirable of the different options. Um, you know, I'm saying that she's got just them gonna... all tuned up to always do a Q9, so I think it may not be hard to just, instead of putting the little ICC reminders, is to go ahead and just say do it. Um, the problem is, is that we've already built this into into Epic for all of us. But this is Lisa. I just wanted to say that with phase three, I'm really looking forward to see if that will impact our rates of depression screening because we've added the question, do you have a history of depression? Because then the workflow changes because if you have a history of depression, then doing the nine appears to be the most appropriate because we're no longer screening. They have a history of depression. And so I think some of the challenges is that the 2Q is negative in someone who's treatment. So that's one of the other reasons why we think maybe our screening is so low. So I'm eager to see over the next year how that reflects our screening rate. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I agree that the phase three setup is, um, I think, answers some of the challenges that we've had with um, what to do with a PHQ-2, um, you know, where people that do interventions for a positive PHQ-2 that didn't ever do a PHQ-9 or they do the PHQ-9 without having a PHQ-2 uh, to start with, and some of those other questions that have been, you know, driv driven around doing that. And I, I do think that that 
you know, where we're likely to make a difference is around women that already have depression. Um, and uh, there's been always questions about why bother doing a screening for women in that situation. And it's, um, we haven't had the ability to document effectively around that. All right, I have to run. Thank you, guys. Bye. Nice thank you so much. You um, thank you so much, everyone, for attending. And then also a special thank you to um, Dr. Marco and Dr. Bennett. Um, I will be sending this out to everybody to review and to listen in again. Thank you again so much, guys. Bye. Bye. All right, see you. Bye.